Welcome to The Investing Show, where we discuss the news that matters to investors and ideas to help you make more of your money. I'm Simon Lambert and this is Money. Joining me here in the studio, I've got my two regular investing show partners in crime, Richard Hunter of Hargreaves Lansdowne and Nick Batsford of Tip TV. Simon. Coming up later on today's show, we've got Jeremy Lang of our Devra Asset Management to talk to us a bit about how he invests and the contrarian attitude he takes to some companies. But first, a quick look at some of the things that have been going on recently. Nick, oh, sorry, Richard, um, you're going to look at something that's coming up in the future, aren't you, hopefully? The Santa Rally for the end of the year. Yes, that's right. It's that time of year, um, festive, and, and the press um, have already, of course, started um, wheeling out the Santa Rally. So we thought we'd take a quick look at uh, whether there's a, a, um, any uh, basis of fact behind it whatsoever or, or whether indeed it's just uh, a December story and nothing else. So. Uh, we've got a graph which um, is basically analysis based uh, on the FTSE All Share for the last 30 years, so that's the end of 1985. And the best performing month of the year over those 30 years is December. Um, on average, it, uh, it returns about 2.6%. The green dots um, that you can see on the graph are the average return, negative or positive, for each month over those 30 years. And then obviously the vertical lines are just showing the maximum return or, or loss indeed that there has been um, over that period of time. For example, if you look at October, it shows in terms of that vertical line that when it's bad, it's really bad. It's, it's a scary looking month that <laughs> October, isn't it? And uh, obviously, apart from the recent-ish financial crisis, there's the uh, 97, 1987 crash just about slips into the 30 years as well. So uh, that's going to have um, some impact. Although having said that, over the 30 years, October actually uh, returns a positive 0.6% with the uh, worst month of the year over that period actually being September. There's, there's also something of an Easter rally which we, uh, we never read about. The, the, the second best returning month after December is, is April at 2.3%. So on that basis alone, if you really had to categorise something, it's certainly no basis for investment um, per se. Um, but actually there, there seems to be some heft behind the fact that um, December and indeed the, the Santa Rally um, actually does exist. Well, we, we've looked at this the last couple of years actually and I think also there's an element that comes into it where it doesn't arrive with the advent calendars does it? It's not the 1st of December, it sort of starts slightly into the month, is that correct? Yes it is and um, that's why one of the reasons is whether it exists or not, there, there are a number of theories uh, why it might be the case. Um, a, a slightly off the wall theory which uh, probably is, is not worth spending too much time on it is the, the fact that um, you know people invest their Christmas bonuses that that credits people with a superhuman uh, sort of attitude obviously so probably not too much in that one um, another theory again I'm not absolutely sure something about uh, sort of window dressing fund managers selling off some of the stocks that haven't been doing so well and and sort of them riding the wave of, of the year's performance unfortunately that would obviously come undone straight away when you look at the uh, year's performance as a whole because your performance wouldn't be that good even though you're holding winning stocks um, is it just a sentiment thing that investors feel more optimistic than usual uh, running up to the Christmas period. I think the fourth and, and probably my favourite theory quite simply is that in December uh, running into the holiday season after Thanksgiving in the States and obviously uh, UK side as well volumes are a lot lower that means that any sort of um, movements can be exacerbated and it's not inconceivable that fund managers will be doing some late December buying for their own stocks in terms of positioning for the following year so any sort of buying pressure could actually have more of an impact than it would normally have against those lower volumes. It could also be an argument, I suppose, against the sort of overactive trading, overactive investor s sort of feeling that you get, whereby basically there's less people doing less stuff and making less mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, again, uh, as the graph is showing, that um, reasonably, reasonably positive return um, is tending not just to be towards the latter part of December, but it tends to go maybe with some early year optimism into, into early January as well. Now, for those who uh, are interested in past things, although obviously it's no guide to fu future performance, etc., this is the FTSE All Share. When the FTSE All Share has risen over the 11 months leading up to December, which it actually has this year if you include dividends, it's around 2% uh, positive net return, uh, the market will rise 95% of the time over this 30 year period. And obviously if, if it's uh, been going in the other direction, the 86% of the time 
the all share rises in December goes down to 63% if the market's been going in the other direction. So for the last 30 years, R2B believe there's a 95% of a Santa rally this year. Excellent. Well, it's well, good luck to investors. I was just saying, <laughs> September being the worst month, the, the argument's always been that in all, July and August, all the juniors are managing all the trading desks, and then the big bosses come back in, and I guess from that we're saying that they're, they're sellers for choice every September. Sure, sure. <laughs> Preparing themselves for a bad <laughs> month in October as well, yeah. aren't they? Well, hopefully it will be a good December, and then we'll get a good start to January, and then we can start talking about whether January will then prove to be the... Uh, the, the plan for the rest of the year, won't Absolutely. we? Which is the other one that we discussed. Absolutely. Yeah. Nick, you're going to look backwards, aren't you? I'm going to look backwards. Um, a little bit of press review. Um, the headline was a volatile year for investors and the ride ain't over yet. This was a piece by John Authors, The Long View and the FT at the weekend. And he was saying what a long, strange trip it's been. The biggest event as far as the market's concerned, the first um, rise in US interest rates in almost a decade is almost a racing certainty after the last, number, uh, last Friday's unemployment numbers. Quite interesting, I read a statistic recently, over 30% of people on Wall Street haven't worked in an environment of rising interest rates. So that makes me a little bit nervous. Um, 2015, the consensus at the beginning of the year, the Fed would start raising rates. ECB would resort to unorthodox measures to jolt life into its economy. Two-year government yields, highly sensitive to interest rate expectations in the US of below 1%. In Germany, minus 0.3%. Stunningly low. ECB have just cut rates resorted to QE and then extended QE. German and US markets are almost exactly where they started the year. And his point was the US market stayed close to its high set in May. And that's worth noting, I think. Despite likely Fed tightening was largely because of expected infusions from other central banks printing money. Then we had the summer, the panic over China, Greece, Volkswagen, some dreadful corporate uh, profit numbers. But the dollar at the end of the day is up 9% on the year. Last Thursday, we saw the euro rally, second biggest gain in history. Um, ho, 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 Goldman Sachs call a parity for the euro dollar by year ends. Um, they're currently reviewing that call. Um, the key points, the world economy, not very exciting. China's growth slower than it was. I see there's an independent report today talking about GDP circa 6.8. 7%. Uh, Eurozone appears to be improving a tad. Investor confidence continues to be weak, requiring regular doses of cash from central banks. Expectations matter. We saw a big correction last week. Expectations weren't met. And finally, his point is it's, well, it's as well to be braced for volatility to continue and to intensify. Can things really get more volatile? Maybe. I mean, the one, so what I'd say I think is the big change over the course of the year is that if you looked at the start of this year, you had investors saying they were concerned about the Fed putting up rates. Now you get to the end of the year and investors are saying that they're going to be concerned if the Fed doesn't Don't. put up rates. So it's gone from being something that's feared to something that's hoped for. Now the knock-on effects of what could happen when those rates do rise, who knows, it's been a long time since they've gone up. But that, I think, is a very interesting change in sentiment. Well, the, the Interest rates are almost certainly going to rise uh, in, in the December meeting. Um, it's pretty sure that the market will then start talking about how many times they're going to rise next year, whether it's going to be twice or three times. But I think uh, amidst the knee-jerk reaction we'll undoubtedly see from the market, it's fairly important to note that uh, the US Fed are well aware that they won't want to raise too far too fast and derail the economic recovery that's uh, obviously entrenched enough for them to be raising rates in the first place. So that will cause volatility, even though taking a step back, it needn't necessarily do so, need to do so. Although there is a very interesting uh, gap between what the Fed thinks it's going to do with interest rates and what <laughs> the market thinks it, yeah. the Fed is going to do with interest rates. And the market is betting that the Fed is not going to raise interest rates as many times as the Fed suggests. And the Fed is sticking to its guns and saying that it will do. So I think that will be an interesting thing to watch. Well, I think another interesting thing is the Bank of England, Mr Carney. Here we are at the end of 2016 and we don't appear to be anywhere near interest rates in the UK going up. I guess we've got to decide which side we're on. Are we on the, the side of the states or on the side of Europe, the, the loosening side or the tightening side? I have um, my very strong views on that. I think we'll we, do we that for January. We have to be quite concerned about you know the pound as well, because if we start tightening, then the pound is probably going to rise substantially against mm. the euro. And that, I think, has a, a knock-on effect for the economy, doesn't it? Sure, sure it does, yeah. And indeed, borrowing costs. Mm. 
Well, the one thing I've got to look at quickly before we move on to the second part of the show is hot off the press, the best performing investment trusts of the year to date so far. And it's been good news for those people who've invested in smaller companies of the Japanese, European and UK hues, and also Japan and UK all companies have done well. So year to date, we've got Japanese smaller companies up 21%, uh, European smaller companies also up 21%, Japan itself, again, rounded up 21%, and then UK smaller companies 18% and UK oil companies 15% which actually, if you draw a comparison, certainly for the UK oil company sector, with the FTSE all share, which uh, year to date is up a tiny little bit, as we were talking about earlier, pretty much flat, it does actually show that you know, there is some value in active management out there. If you bought a tracker, then you, you would not have made that amount of money. Um, and to pick out some individual trusts that have done exceptionally well, the top performing trust, according to the AIC figures, is Yatra Capital, which invests in Indian property. So if you had decided to put your money into Indian property at the start of the year and got lucky and chosen the right investment <laughs> trust, which is highly unlikely, I should add, you would have made a handsome 56% return. Wow. And that's followed up by uh, Linsell Train, uh, which is an investment trust uh, managed by Nick Train. Slightly odd, though, because I think it holds a stake in the actual Linsell Train fund management business and trades at a very, very high premium, to the point where a couple of years back, Nick Train advised people not to buy it on that premium. Uh, we've then got Bailey Gifford, Shin Nippon, JP Morgan Midcap and the British and American Investment Trust. So to any of our viewers who invested in any of those trusts, well done. Well done. You've had a good year. Uh, I hope the rest of you have too. Coming up after the break, we've got Jeremy Lang of our Devra UK Income Fund to talk to us about his approach. Join us then. Welcome back to The Investing Show. Joining us here in the studio, we've got Jeremy Lang, of Ardevra Asset Management. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so, Ardevra, you, you started up that company yourself, didn't you, after leaving Lion Trust, where you've been for some time. Could you tell us a bit about the decision to, to do that? Yeah, well, I started it up with uh, William Patterson, who uh, has worked with me uh, for about 10 years at Lion Trust, and then prior to that, we, we started together at, at James Capel, and he and I uh, run money together pretty much all our working lives. Um, and so uh, we both wanted to work in an environment which was, if you like, free of interference. Um, and as a fund manager, when you work in big organizations, there are lots of different agendas and sometimes they are not best suited perhaps to, to your end client. So uh, we thought the best way of, uh, of doing what we love, which is fund management, uh, is to set up our own business, to run our own money, uh, but do it in a, like, uh, as a proper fund management business rather than just as a little family office so we could run other people's money as well so that was the motivation so he and I could work sort of forever really. Mm -hmm. And I think contrarian is a word that's probably bandied out around an awful lot in the investing world probably a bit too much and probably gets applied to many things but you do have an unusual approach I think to, to picking companies first of all I understand that you, you don't like to meet the company management. Yeah that's right uh, I mean I think being contrarian is about taking the same information that's out there that anybody else can look at, but just looking at it in a, in a different way, if you like, coming in at a different angle. So, you know, one of our takes from lots of experience, I guess, of meeting company management and investing in businesses and then watching them go wrong is that, you know, it's clearly a, it's a risky exercise buying stocks and shares, and it's risky putting your trust in management uh, to deliver good outcomes for you. So I'm afraid, having been battle scarred quite a lot, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of cynic here. So uh, I generally view uh, investing in companies as, as, as difficult. I generally view the people that run them as being quite risky, perhaps riskier than you would like them to be. Um, and so I see most of my job is trying to work out which companies at the moment are quite safe and that definitely doesn't involve me going to meet the guys that run them. So they can convince you otherwise? That's right, because my experience, having worked for a publicly co quoted company myself and being a main board director, uh, that uh, the people that end up running businesses are generally very slick communicators um, and part of what they want a fund manager to do is is to like them and trust them um, and uh, ultimately not sell their shares. So I'd rather keep a safe di distance. 
So how do you go about looking for companies that you're interested in? So as I say, I start by assuming that most of the businesses out there are going to be too risky for me. Um, and so I just try and work out under what circumstances like any manager, no matter how good or bad, uh, could possibly uh, um, be running a business in a relatively low risk way. So I'm, I'm kind of like almost the opposite end of the spectrum to someone like Warren Buffett who, who thinks that you know your job is, as a fund manager is to find the good managers. I sort of start by assuming that they're all not very good. Um, and so I think what's much more important is the environment that a business faces. And that's both how the business operates and I, so I simplistically view if you like businesses as easy or difficult to break because I kind of assume that managers in some sense want to break them by taking too much risk. So I prefer if you like difficult to break businesses which is why I like businesses like Next say. Um, and then also um, this is where I'm, I'm kind of slightly unconventional particularly as an income manager. Uh, often I like growth because I, I think growth is a bit like a drug for risk taking management and so um, most managers want to grow. So um, uh, sometimes it can be safer to find a business where if you like growth is easy um, so managers can take some risk and get rewarded quite quickly uh, and so as long as the growth is there then it can be safer than perhaps a, a, a difficult to break business where the growth is running out which is why you know I would like a business like Arm say which doesn't pay any dividend uh, whereas I'd be very nervous of a business like Tesco's say which is a very difficult to break business but where if you like they've run out of growth but they're still trying too hard. So you mentioned um, Arm and Next. Are there any other companies at the moment in the UK that you like the look of? Well I end up with quite an eclectic mix of stocks uh, and this is again possibly why I'm a bit unusual as an income manager because uh, the income paying bit comes right at the end for me. I'm much more interested in whether the businesses I invest in are uh, going through a phase where they look relatively low risk and that's the other thing I'm, I, you know I, I think all these things are transient um, and then after I think I've got a collection of what at the moment look reasonably safe businesses then I think I can make money either if other investors have got a lot of anxiety around those businesses British Aerospace, Rent-A-Kill um, or their businesses um, where the sell side analysts, those professional forecasters out there are more error prone uh, in a particular direction so they're more likely to get surprised than disappointed and a lot of my work in that is is taking some in what I think is interesting stuff out of cognitive psychology which is studying basically how easy it is to make mistakes um, and uh, it's often a lot easier than you would like to believe. And so do you look at all sizes of company, do you look down to the mid caps to smaller companies as well or do you tend to focus on larger companies and also how important is the balance sheet to you as well? Okay so size, because um, uh, I play this game if you like of trying to see where other people are wrong, um, I have to be very careful myself because uh, I have lots of experience of being wrong. Now one of the things once you get interested in bias and, and cognitive psychology that you learn is that bias is this slippery animal where you even if you're aware that you have it it's very difficult almost impossible to get rid of it um, and so the only way you can survive if you know you're error prone is you can try and limit the damage when you are wrong and so that's why I don't go into small caps. Uh, it's not that they're difficult to buy it's it's they're difficult to sell um, and I'm bound to have to sell my small caps at some stage because I'm bound to get some of them wrong so I don't care what the potential returns are down there I just rather not go so I tend to fish in the upper end of mid cap and FTSE where I know I can move around uh, reasonably well. Um, I suppose it's true as well that when the dial moves against those companies it doesn't tend to move quite as hard as it does against the small cap does it? Uh, that's right and also you see uh, uh, people's attitude to risk is also what interests me so when I'm, I, when I'm trying to survey what other investors are doing and whether they're more error prone it's, it, I'm looking for signs that their anxiety is dissipating or, or building and uh, the impact of shifting anxiety is exaggerated down in small cap because of that liquidity thing so basically when everybody gets nervous liquidity dries up and it's very difficult to move around so you get much more violent moves down there whereas up at the more liquid end um, you don't tend to get that so much so that sort of risk on risk off sort of flippity floppity stuff uh, you, you get thrown around a lot more down in small cap. 
But you sound more like a risk manager than a fund manager. Yeah, well, I, I think that, see, I think one of the most common biases that people like me have is that they think, you know, we're all taught to think about risk and reward. You know, that's the mantra for investment. But I think most people start with the reward. How much money can I make? And you're flipping it. Yeah, and I think that we know from lots of interesting uh, studies at, outside of the financial uh, uh, industry, doctors, uh, project managers, uh, that your, the order in which you, you kind of make your decision can have a big impact on wh where, where your biases come out. So if you start by thinking about reward and then you think about risk, I effectively you taint your view on risk by having that second. And so you can justify all sorts of things because you think the reward's worth it. Well, so I think that just that it's a very simple trick uh, to try and limit my bias. If I just flip it around the other way and go, well, let's, let's just unpick, let's deselect all the stuff that, that is out there that's too risky and not even think about the reward. Um, uh, and then after we've done that, let's look at what's left and there isn't that much left, actually, where you go, mm, I can get comfortable with the risk because it is a risky place. But you'll get a smaller subset. And then there is a chance that of some of those other investors will be telling you that for some reason they do think it's anxiety inducing and risky. And that's your opportunity. Or there'll be sell side analysts who they like the business, but somehow they don't appreciate maybe how unusual it is or how fast it can grow. And that's where your reward is. But you only want to be playing in that safe pool to be begin with. Do you, do you find that your investment style is sort of nimble and frequent or on the basis that you've done the risk before you even start uh, do you find yourself holding for a longer period of time? Well I kind of sit in the middle so what I find is if I get it right if you like then I can often like Next is a good example mm. um, uh, I can own a business for three four five uh, even more years as long as management don't change not the people but the way they behave don't change um, but there are other faster moving things out there like what other investors think about it what other analysts think about it so if they change too far the other way then no matter how safe I think it is if everybody else thinks it's really safe time to move on also I get it wrong and you don't want to be hanging on to stuff mm. that you get wrong so my average holding period collapses down to more like 18 months um, because there's other faster moving things changing and also I just get it wrong and I don't want to be hanging around if I if I worked out I, I, I get it wrong so I sit in that sort of slightly almost schizophrenic middle mm. where I can have some things I've owned as short as a week where uh, some new piece of information has come out and I've gone oh my god that's not what I expected time to move on and then other ones like next where you go oh yeah same boring mantra from management fantastic I like boring uh, or when everybody else is still a little bit skeptical about skeptical about them because they're retailers and everybody worries about that Fantastic. Uh, another quarter can go by and I can sit on my hands. So, so it's not a question of being a bottom-up or top-down investor particularly because obviously you can have risks in either Everywhere. of those directions. So it's, it's just a question of, of just looking at, uh, you know, what are we limited by and uh, what, what is this company bulletproof? For or not, yeah, and and also be aware that things can change. Sure. The, I think the hardest thing you can uh, you do in this job is you're very tempted to want to make bold predictions, and I think you've got to resist that. You just got to read what's in front of you. You wake up every morning, you see what the new stuff is in there, and go, does it change anything, and not be too confident that mm. you can you know that you can out forecast everybody else. So, oh, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, unfortunately, quickly because we're going to run out of time, but. Uh, one of the things I was interested in is I think I read that you'd invested in Facebook and Amazon in the, yeah, in the right. global portfolio that you guys run. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was the decision that, that made you decide to go into them? What do you see there as an attraction? Okay, two quite different things. First, first of all, the thing that unifies those two businesses is I like unusual businesses. That's the first thing because I think unusual businesses are easier to get wrong. Uh, also, I like investing in businesses that make other people uncomfortable. Um, and you, that's not just this is why I suppose I'm contrarian. See, most people think discomfort is associated with being a value investor, uh, but uh, it's not. Uh, investing in businesses like Facebook or Amazon also makes a lot of people very uncomfortable, partly because the way they're doing things is unusual and new, and partly because of the valuations. So a lot of people think risk is about overvaluation, whereas I don't view risk that way. So straight away, 
just those simple generic things are going to get me interested in businesses like Facebook and Amazon. Unusual, and when I, when I listen to other people, when they question me about that, I can sense the discomfort about them. Mm. They go, oh, that, it's easier to be wrong in those sorts of businesses. So that's great. Now, uh, that's where they, they're the same. What's different about them is I also like businesses where they come in a blaze of glory in an IPO, you know, they get publicly quoted, and then they duff it early on. Because that's a lot of that's a lot of disappointed people. And Facebook is the classic. And example. Facebook is a classic. So I didn't buy Facebook uh, on the IPO or shortly afterwards. I sat and watched it, and then if I'm lucky, they trip over, um, and then you get a lot of anxiety. And then bizarrely, it's more like a value stock for me, even though the headline valuation is very high. It's a lot lot cheaper than it was. That tells me there's a lot of anxiety. Amazon's a bit different in that Amazon is a, is a multifaceted business, again, which makes it kind of interesting. There's one bit of the, that business, uh, without getting into too much of the technicalities, which was a major source of anxiety. They, they run big data warehouses, if you like. Um, and Amazon kept saying to the market, this is a really good business, trust us. And the market went, well, we don't really trust you. It's, you know, it's different from what you did before. So finally, uh, uh, earlier this year, they broke that business out in terms of disclosure. And they said, it's called AWS. And they said, look, OK, here it is. And everybody went, my god, that's not a bad business. That's a great business. Now, I love situations like that, if you like, where a source of anxiety suddenly flips and, and should be a source of optimism. Because my experience with most people is they don't like 180s. Yeah. Um, and so that gives you a nice long opportunity as everybody slowly drags their view round. Um, and that's the opportunity. Great. Jeremy, fascinating stuff. I'm really sorry. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you for joining us. Richard, thank you very much. John. Thank you very much. Thanks. Join us next time for The Investing Show. Goodbye.